Um, yeah. Well, I was asked to talk about uh, same-day discharge, and the main reason is my hospital's been doing this for about five years, mostly out of necessity rather than some preordained um, let's do research trial. So let's see. Do I do? Great. Um, so I'd like to talk a little bit about some of the literature, why bother with same-day discharge, um, what are the benefits, if you're going to do it, of uh, using the radial approach, are there any guidelines available, and then um, I can show you the experience within the Providence system since uh, there's a fair number of you who are in our group, but more importantly, Providence has about 25,000 discharge or um, PCI per year, 20,000 PCI per year. So it's a really large experience, and we can see what um, how that works in our group. Um, as far as the benefits, uh, patient satisfaction certainly one of the big ones. Um, Mount Sinai and Baylor did a trial together, uh, showing that. 80% of the patients who had same-day discharge would choose that same mode of uh, discharge again. I'll show you a little bit more about that. Um, it really is patient-centered care. I can tell you from the patients who have, um, who do go home, and in our area, everybody pretty much expects it rather than some unique thing. Uh, they really get upset when you tell them they have to stay overnight. Um, and then, there is a significant drop in iatrogenic complications of staying in the hospital. You all know about these. They don't happen frequently, but when they happen, they can be disastrous. Um, as far as the financial benefits, I remember when we first discussed this about two years ago, and um, our executive vice president at the time, you guys remember Randy Axelrod, mm -hmm. told me, why would you want to do this? You can make more money keeping them in the hospital. That's no longer true. Um, with the new Medicare guidelines, you know, you can't justify keeping someone after PCI two nights, so you're only going to get an observation status no matter what, even if you keep them overnight. So now the tables have turned, and I'll show you how um, there's a significant cost savings. Uh, PCI is pretty safe. We're talking here, we've had some discussions about um, uh, adjusting relatively small facets of PCI that might take 20,000 patients, John, you were talking about, to prove benefit. We've gotten to the point where this is an incredibly safe procedure. So uh, why is it that we don't send patients home like they do for cholecystectomy, uh, TURP, uh, hernia repairs, et cetera? Well, in the literature, most of the trials are pretty small. I'll show you a few that are bigger. Um, there hasn't been a single study of all the ones that have been looked at that has shown harm from sending patients home same day. That's really important. Everybody worries that if you send them home same day, you're going to do something bad for your patient, and nobody likes that. Um, Twelve of the studies out of 20 use radial artery as their primary means of access, but eight of them showed femoral, and I'll show you our data. Up until two and a half years ago, we didn't do radials, so our data really is a combination of both. Uh, there are guidelines from the SCAI. I'll show you that those guidelines are really conservative. They're probably a good place to start, but not where you want to end. Um, this was a randomized trial looking at uh, it was really done also for a REAPRO, uh, but it also, this is from Bertrand's group, which is far and away the largest experience with radio out of Canada. Um, they found there's no difference if you send patients home as far as anything, and this is just their uh, CPK MB data using REAPRO. After um, PCI, a meta-analysis looked at 12,000 patients, 37 studies published two years ago in Jack. Only seven of those were randomized. So they divided up the data into those that were observational and those that were randomized, which is important because they're obviously, we know, not the same validity. But um, studies um, in the... Uh, 
transradial group, 60%, interesting, were in the randomized group, but transfemoral was more common in the observational group. So, um, I'm not sure why that is, but um, so in the randomized clinical trials, there were no differences in any death, MI, uh, lesion revascularization, or major bleeding or vascular complications. Two-thirds of the patients had stable angina. 27%, which is pretty high, had multivessel coronary disease. And 87% um, of the randomized patients actually went home same day, which is important because obviously if you have a high number where you said you're going to send them home but you didn't, that's going to um, change your results. So um, in another trial, assessing patient reported outcomes, this is that Mount Sinai and Baylor group. They looked at a three-year period, only 150 patients, but they truly were randomized. Um, actually, 300 patients, 150 in each group. The primary outcome was patient coping and their preferences. They were quite similar with regards to their sociodemographic and clinical characteristics. I'm not going to show you all those numbers, but they were basically the same. And then they did look at um, clopridogrel adherence, which obviously would be important. One of the things you would worry about is you didn't really have any time to do patient education. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you that in our group, doctors don't do patient education <laughs> anymore on same-day patients. Fortunately, we have really good nurses and PAs, and they do the patient education. Without them, I don't think it would be successful. My guess is you all have somebody of similar stature. So that's a good question, Mark. So do you have the nurses doing it? Because there's a difference between a nurse and a sort of a, a whatever we call the nurse practitioners and the physician's assistants, because those are two different levels. And um, is, is that, do you have I one should, of those? Um, I use them interchangeably. Uh, we have very low turnover in staff. Yeah. We have three nurses who've been with us 20 years. Okay. They function as PAs. Right, got it. So when I, I'm trying to translate into right. the more common world where right. you have PAs. Right. Our, we've been told when our nurses go, Providence will never let us have another nurse do what they do. Right. Because they have privileges to function as PAs. That's interesting. Okay. Um, so this is just the data. Obviously, on the same day group, uh, patients like it. The um, white is satisfied with discharge timing. Um, and then you can see the other ones. All right. Why now? So. Um, there's several things that can help to uh, make this more common in your practice. You know, for those of you who are old, a lot of gray hair like me, you used to use eight French guides, then seven French guides, now six French guides. Now we hear about sheaths that are five French and let you use six French guides. It's just we don't have the kind of access problems we used to have. Um, we don't use bivalorudin. I know there are people here who do. Um, we've never used it. Uh, with heparin, you don't have some of the issues with turnoff phenomenon. I'm not going to get into the argument of which is better at the moment. Um, we Nobody uses the kind of 2B3A they used to use. Um, I think that's pretty much a given. Vascular closure devices, I told you we didn't start using radial until about two and a half years ago, three years ago. Um, we use per close on every... Um, transfemoral case that's going to go home, so we've never had a late bleed. Um, that's important because two hours down, two hours up, and you go home. And when we say home in Montana or Sheridan, Wyoming, or some of the other places, we mean far away. Um, there are ranches that are as big as Portland mm -hmm. between here and where they're going. <laughs> um, there aren't many people there, but there are ranches. A lot of cows. A lot of cows. A lot of sheep. <laughs> All right. Uh, we know that the latest generation stents also are very, very safe there. It's, like I said, every acute thrombosis that I've seen was due to a mechanical complication, not something that would have been avoided with Integralin or Reapro or Cangrelor or whatever. Even uh, when you take, I just, the year before last, retook my interventional boards. I mean, that's the one place that IVUS really has been proven as a use is to find out why a patient has acute thrombosis. All right. Um, so some NCDR data. Uh, as you know, they have huge numbers. So here's 107,000 patients. Um, this is unadjusted in-hospital mortality. It's incredibly safe procedure, 0.2%. 
in the 2011 look at this in JAMA, um, the uh, re-hospitalization rates were 9.5 and 9.6 percent. I suspect it's a lot less now that Medicare is focusing on this. But notice only one and a half or one and a quarter percent of patients were discharged the same day. What's the complication rates within the first 48 hours? Well, here's the numbers. They're incredibly um, minimal. And of those complications, the vast majority occur within six hours. So if you, when you start, if you put your attempted same-day discharge patients in the morning, by the time they go home, you will have seen whatever's coming. Um, all right, in our experience, we started back in 2009. Our observation unit, some people would call it a pre-procedure unit. Also, we call it a post-procedure unit because it's the same thing. It was built in 1981, and we haven't been able to get money to make it bigger. So we ran out of bed space, and we had to start thinking about how to send patients home. We didn't do it as a research trial or anything like that. We now have the philosophy, and this is important if you're going to start this. When you start, you'll first have criteria for going home, but eventually you'll have criteria for why to keep them. That's a huge difference in a mind switch. And when I show you the numbers, you'll understand how that um, translates into the number of patients who actually go. It's not, frankly, unlike when you start doing radials. Um, I can say I would. I was nervous, and I came to this course um, bias uh, disclosure. This was how I learned radials was here. And uh, I was nervous when I first went home. Now it's like, well, why wouldn't I do radio on this case? Um, so we send everybody home who can go home. Uh, anybody who's admitted, even non-STEMIs, unstable angina, whatever, if they come in in the middle of the night and they get cath the next day, they go home same day. Uh, we've done about two and a half thousand patients now. Not a single one has returned within 24 hours due to harm from same-day discharge. I will say that sometimes the patients who go home from late in the day, we ask them if they live far away to stay at a hotel in town, and everybody does that. Um, we do it just to placate, I think, ourselves. Mm -hmm. but no one's ever had to come back in. So uh, This is the Swedish Providence experience. Um, these are hospitals within the Providence system. I'm not going to name any of them except SP Purple is St. Pat's. Just to give you an idea, that's the hospital I come from. Um, for those of you who are in Providence, you could probably pick out your hospital. Notice, this is elective patients discharge alive. 80% is what we send home. Okay? That's in the entire year 2014. Um, well, um, if you look at what percent are elective, this just gives you an idea across our system. So the white is considered outpatient uh, elective uh, patients, and we're the ones in purple. So about 40% of our business is elective, of which 80% are going home. Uh, we don't use any bivalirudin. We're the ones on the left that where there's a zero there, so you don't see any color. So you don't need to use bivalirudin to do a same-day discharge program. Um, and since you're trying to save money, if you're going to do same-day discharge, your hospital is going to save a huge amount of money, as I'll show you. Uh, that would be important. You would be trading one cost factor for another just to have the bed available. Uh, in terms of transfusions and bleeding, um, we are in purple, so you can be quite low and um, still do same-day discharge. In fact, you probably should be quite low. If you have problems with bleeding, you probably need to solve that first before you consider a same-day discharge program. Look at what all the factors are that go into that. Um, our access uh, in 2014 was 33%, or about a third of the patients. Um, we have two operators who do radial, preferably, and one and a half who don't. So uh, that's pretty much where that data comes from. Um, you could say, well, you know, St. Pat's, you guys do easy cases, so that's why you can do that. But our expected more, this is NCDR data, so we would have 
um, at least average, if not higher, um, expected mortality. That's the solid bar. And then the observed, I'm sorry, the observed is a solid bar, solid bar and the expected is the hash. And then you should try to get uh, system wide or institutional buy in. I think it's hard to do same day discharge with all of the political and um, financial and clinical factors. You have nurses who really have to buy into this or it won't be successful. So, you want these are all the operators. We now have three left. Uh, one is mostly retired, and we're all about the same. I mean, that's important if you have 14 doctors in your group who are doing intervention, you want to try to corral them and get them to agree on some standards. All right, um, let's get through that. So how to get started? Well, uh, as I said, there are SCAI guidelines, and you can get these off the internet. Uh, this is the um, their guidelines, which would be stable angina, negative biomarkers, um, uncomplicated procedure, which is pretty obvious. These are really conservative, uh, single vessel stenting, immediate access, uh, normal, near normal EF. We don't do any of this. Uh, ours are way more liberal than that. So this just gives you an idea. My uh, friend and colleagues at uh, Providence Sacred Heart, which is the largest hospital in um, Providence, um, they have started a very nice program over there to do same day discharge. And these are their criteria on the left which are pretty similar to the SCAI criteria. Our criteria are on the right, and if you notice, they're pretty liberal. I think the biggest issues are the patient needs a support system at home. So I, the, of those that don't go home, the majority are people who uh, didn't have anybody really to take them home except a friend who's gonna drop them off and they're elderly and frail and you're worried. Um, of course, if there's any complications, they don't go home. But we don't have any creating clearance issues. Distance means nothing. Um, in Montana, you know, Dillon, Montana from St. Pat's is 150 miles. Salmon, Idaho, um, another 130 miles and so on. Can't have a complication, obviously. But there's no ejection fraction limits unless they're in significant heart failure. So it's clinical based. Um, we just don't see much bleeding problems. Even the person who doesn't do radials, he does uh, perclose on everybody, and we have a lot of experience. So um, groins aren't really much of a management problem. We also, by the way, um, I know it's not a femoral course, but uh, as John knows, we demand that um, the text show a fluoro stored image with a cooked needle over the femoral head and a dot on the patient's skin. So it's free. It takes them 10 seconds, but it means you're never sticking too high or too low. So it's very important. And it's amazing how many times it has no correlation to skin crease and so on. So we never stick without knowing exactly where we're sticking. Um, this just is, uh, this is the Sacred Heart look at their uh, savings and um, $2,700 per case. Um, and then they divided it up into these uh, different uh, area, different parts of a patient's stay. That's a lot of money. If you work for the hospital, you could ask for half of that. Uh -huh. <laughs> you probably wouldn't get it if you work with Providence. <laughs> um, all right, process considerations. So. Uh, patient and staff education, I, I can't stress enough how important this is. Uh, we have uh, documents that we send home with the patient. By the way, we'd be happy to share this, uh, whatever we have with any of you. Uh, you can reach us through John's group. I think we, the slides may go on a, uh, a thumb drive, so they may have access to all that. So uh, we could probably we'll give, we'll, yeah, yeah. Um, and then, as I say, nursing and uh, PAs are the ones who really are going to likely spend the time. You're all busy. Um, you're really here to um, learn a new technique, which is wonderful, but you probably don't have time to spend a good half hour just sitting there and going over um, all the things that patients have questions about. Um, 
At Sacred Heart, they require a physician visit prior to discharge. Probably when you're starting, that's good. So you can look at the access site, groin or wrist, and make sure you're comfortable with it, but we don't. Um, and then um, when they started, they're not letting people go more than 60 miles. We don't have any of that. Um, I was interested that you guys are going to send them home with a kit. We don't do that. Our hospital is very much against giving drugs to a patient because there's some kind of outpatient um, prohibition by Medicare to give drugs to a patient going home. Uh, they're not allowed to compete with local pharmacies. Yeah. I, so you, hospitals get it, of course, at a huge discount. Right. I, uh, of course, if you're taking I, it out of your I, office. I, yeah, I, exactly. I, I really could care less about the hospital in this situation. <laughs> um, obviously, contact numbers. Uh, when you first start, you want to make phone calls to make sure the patient's okay in the next day or two. I think that makes everybody feel better, the patient and uh, physician. Um, cardiac referrals is an issue. Um, how do you get this done while you're sending the patient home? That's something you might be concerned about, but you just have to get that process set up. Um, again, we just talked a little bit about discharge meds, family education, and then a phone call. Patients like that. This is from Sacred Heart. This is a very nice little uh, short uh, survey that they give the patients um, when they're starting up to see what the patient thinks and then they can collate it and adjust things accordingly. This is my final slide. Um, you think you're starting this program. Your nurses think you're starting a different program. Your PAs think you're starting a third program. And the patient doesn't know when you first start what you're saying. You might mean you can go home. No one ever goes home. My family doesn't go home. Now in Missoula, Everybody says, what do you mean? Why do I have to stay? I know Joe Schmo and Jane Doe. They never stayed in the hospital. Mm -hmm. So be very clear with everybody. Have your team meet and discuss these things ahead of time as much as you can, and then meet on a relatively frequent basis when you're first starting out, not just, after, not just, just before it starts. Okay. So. Um, Great, Mark. Thanks, thanks very much. That's really very useful. Thank <laughs> you.